because sometimes I imagine myself to be a historian. I'm going to start in the year 1492 to work my way gradually up to the present. So in January of 1492, the last Muslim dynasty in Al-Andalus surrendered to the Catholic King uh, Ferdinand and the Catholic Queen Isabella. Uh, and part of the agreement that was made in the, in the surrender of all political power and authority was that Muslims living in Spain would continue to have the right to practice and observe their own religion. Uh, seven years later, Cardinal Cisneros had a better idea, and that was to start the process of suppression of Islam in Spain. So violating the treaty that was made in 1492, Cardinal C Cisneros uh, starts to undertake steps to destroy Muslim mosques in Granada. Uh, he also decides to burn uh, books that are written in Arabic. So in the Bib al Ramla, or we'd say in Morocco, Bab al Ramla, uh, in, uh, in Granada, right next to where the Catholic Cathedral is now, right next to where uh, the major Saturday or Friday mosque was in uh, Muslim uh, Granada, there was a massive book burning. So books in Arabic, some of the greatest uh, texts that had been written, were all burned publicly uh, to show how uh, little regard there was for that. A century later, I'm moving uh, a few centuries later, Heinrich Heine, a German Jew, wrote a play called Al-Mansur. And he wrote the play about the events that took place in Granada. Uh, and he said in his play, uh, famously, this is the translation, I'll do it in German if you'd like. <laughs> Me? Yes. No, there's a larger audience. That was only, <laughs> saying the burning of the books, that was only a prelude. Where they burn books, they will in the end burn human beings. Okay, in the 1930s, uh, the Nazis started out by burning books, including Heinrich Heine's Al-Mansur, and they ended up by burning uh, human beings. Let's go forward a little bit in time, so I'm a quick historian. Uh, 1988, uh, Salman Rushdie published his book, Satanic Verses, that many Muslims thought was blasphemous. Now, the, uh, Salman Rushdie's attorney, Jeffrey Rich, uh, Robertson, argued that every single passage that was cited to show the blasphemy of Salman Rushdie was in fact written by a disrep was a, said by a disreputable character in the book. In other words, that these the statements were self condemn self condemnatory, uh, but it was not treated that way. And we started by burning books. So we have satanic verses. Uh, the first slide there. That's what satanic verses looks like after some pious person has decided to burn it. We can go to the next slide. Uh, some uh, Muslims decided to demonstrate against uh, the books, uh, Salman Rushdie's book, and so they went into the streets and protested. Next slide. Uh, there you see one of the books being burned. And we have uh, statements that seem to be, okay, let's now we can butcher people. So we start out by burning books, and we want to end up by uh, butchering uh, people. On February 14th of 1989, the Ayatollah Khomeini issued a fatwa against Salman Rushdie. Uh, we can call this his Valentine's Day fatwa. Uh, this Valentine's Day fatwa called, said that any good, pious Muslim had the authority to murder Salman Rushdie. So a blasphemy of the Prophet or a blasphemy of Islam is going to be responded to by a fatwa saying, not we want to arrest him and try him and have a court convict him, but we are now going to authorize any human being who wants to, to murder this other human being. But the world has entered into a new, a dangerous new precedent. We can really say 1989 is beginning of a phase, not that such things never happened before, but an act of blasphemy, or perceived as blasphemy by some person, can authorize vigilantes to go and kill people who are responsible for that. The person who issued this first fatwa, the Ayatollah Khomeini, by his own writings and by his own position, believed that he was the most knowledgeable Muslim, at least in Iran and maybe the world, 
Uh, he was also either the most pious or one of the most pious. He was also the supreme jurist. So a person having all of this authority within Shia Islam believes he does not need to follow the law. He becomes the law. And he ends up uh, issuing this fatwa. Remember that when they start by burning books, they end up uh, burning human beings. Uh, the translator, although Salman Rush Rushdie has survived, the translator of his book into Japanese was stabbed to death. Uh, his Italian translator was stabbed, though he survived. The Norwegian publisher was shot three times, though he uh, survived. And then the person who published the book in, uh, in Turkey uh, met, had a meeting with Aleviz, and a mob attacked that and burned down the theater where they met. met 37 human beings died in that tragedy. Another 50 were killed. They start by burning books, and they end up by uh, burning human, uh, human beings. So many who watch the, uh, the response to the Charlie Hebdo, Hebdo uh, cartoons were inspired by this outpouring of support for freedom of, ex of expression. And disagreeing slightly with my, uh, with my uh, colleague uh, Doris Gray, I think part of this is spontaneous by people. I think part of it also is orchestrated. But it was a profound and I think powerful march for freedom of expression. But it's not so simple as that. Uh, regardless of whether people were attempting to manipulate it, it is not as though France was known as a bastion for freedom of expression. So my colleague Doris Gray mentioned the Dieudonné, a perfectly good example. Not all expression is permitted. In 2004, the French parliament overwhelmingly enacted a law that said that Muslim schoolgirls did not have the right to freedom of expression to wear a headscarf to public schools. That's a pretty powerful uh, condemnation of freedom of expression. We just had the law on the burqas. So some expression is going to be permit permitted, and some expression is going to be uh, prohibited. Now, these cartoons and these images that Charlie, Charlie Hebdo did has, have a long history uh, to, the, to the videotape. To, oh, that's, that's the, the bombing the, of the publisher in the United States of Satanic Verses. Uh, sorry. Oh, that one doesn't come out. We'll just skip over. That's that's Domier's uh, cartoon. It's not only people with religious sentiments who can have their uh, feelings abused. Those who believe in evolution can also have their feelings abused as well. Now, the problem we can laugh at the cartoon of Darwin being portrayed as a monkey. It's a, not quite so funny when we see this uh, cartoon of uh, French Jews. Uh, being treated as though they are somehow ugly, suspicious, not part of French society, and that they don't really uh, belong. These cartoons end up leading into another new and even more dangerous direction. So here we have the web and that ugly Jewish man looking over that luscious German uh, woman, this, this, the prey, the spider is about to kill. Uh, next slide. Uh, we see another version from Der Sturmer, uh, the, the leading anti-Semitic publica publication in uh, Nazi uh, Germany. And these end up leading to the burning of human beings. Next <laughs> slide, please. Now we see the Pope. This is uh, not our current Pope, but Pope Benedict I. Uh, who, who condemns homosexuals, and we turn him into the devil. This is hate speech. Uh, this is uh, mockery. Uh, this is taking a religious figure. Yet this sort of speech was allowed, and uh, those who make this cartoon are not uh, punished for that or killed for that. Going to the next one, uh, here we have an Israeli guard with a precious uh, a Muslim Palestinian who is locked up and the uh, Israeli guard is about to rape her. Uh, this is not funny. Uh, this is not uh, insightful political expression. This is designed to uh, promote hatred. Uh, and doesn't mean that we agree with one side or the other side, but this is not advancing public speech. It is freedom of expression, but it's also hatred. Let me conclude by suggesting what I think of as being some very important values. One of the important values is freedom of expression. And any attempt to kill people 
uh, barbarically to go in and kill them because of their expression is so utterly out of uh, proportion that it is uh, utterly condemnable. One of the problems of the, of the uh, Charlie Hebdo uh, killing is that those murders ended up confirming the worst stereotypes and the worst prejudices people have about Muslims. That Muslims are killers, Muslims are violent. And so what do you do to show that that's not true? You go and become violent. Uh, so uh, freedom of expression is a very good thing. Telling the truth is a good thing. Uh, but those aren't the only good things. And freedom of expression doesn't mean that you need to express your opinion about everything, everybody to everyone. If you have a classmate or a colleague whom you think of as being particularly ugly, you don't need to say that. That might be the truth, but that's not, <laughs> that's not an appropriate thing to say. So freedom of expression, a very important value. I like the idea of there not being prior restraint, uh, and there should, but there should be consequences. Other values that are important are tolerance. Uh, so it's not freedom of expression only for which we should be marching in Paris, but we should be marching for tolerance. And there was no march, there was no major march for tolerance when Muslim schoolgirls were prohibited from wearing the headscarf. There were some marches, but nothing compared to the Shabli Ebdo. So we like some expression, we don't like some expression. Tolerance is a pretty important uh, value. Respect is a pretty important value. And maybe we should be having marches for, for respect as well. Kindness is another value. Now, these values are all important, so it's not one or the other we have to decide, but we don't necessarily need to be exercising uh, the values of expression at the sake, for the sake uh, of the cost of those other values that may be uh, very important and sometimes even more important.